currently living in I'm currently living in North Macedonia, and I am uh, um, I am a Baha'i. You may have heard of the Baha'i faith, and uh, so um, what what else do you want me to say about? No, that's fine. That's enough. This is a very quick go round. We'll come back to you in a minute, and okay. you can tell us an update. Um, that's great. Thanks, Sean. Uh, why don't you go next? You're on the top. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Hello, uh, Thomas, and hello, everyone else uh, on the Zoom. My name is Sean English. I'm based here in Ireland, and I'm, my background is in peace studies and peace research, and also quite recently in a, a project, a new initiative called Lex Innocentium, the law of the innocence. And <laughs> we'll come back to that because I think Tom has it on the agenda. Thomas has it yes. on the agenda at some stage. So hello to everyone from Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Sean. Yes, we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. Very important. Susan, you're next on my list. Come, come. Welcome. Hello. Hello, everybody. And Thomas, thanks for all you do and sending all those links. Excellent. Anyways, I'm an activist. I'm affiliated with Code Pink, which does a lot of lobbying and calling senators and stuff about the war. The war is going on and I've lived in China and Thailand and have been to India numerous times just with projects. <laughs> and you're based, you're speaking to us from California or where? Yes, California. Yes. Okay, greetings. Yeah, hi. Uh, Amina, your turn. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, Thomas. Hi, everyone. Um so happy to be here. Uh, my name is Amina Siddiqui Aini, and I'm joining you all from the San Francisco Bay Area in California. Uh, I am um, a volunteer, I'm a policy advocate for the Peace Alliance and serve on the National Committee for uh, a campaign for a U.S. Department, um, Department of Peace Building. Um, I'm glad to be here and looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, welcome, Amina. Hello. What time is it in California at the moment? <laughs> it's about nine, so it's nine or six to be exact. So. Okay. Well, thanks for joining. Good morning. Us. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, George, you're next. Go for it. Hello. Welcome. Hello, Thomas, and everyone. Nice to see you. I'm George Mutalema from Tanzania. I teach at Saint Augustine University of Tanzania to Development Studies, and I'm also a moderator of the International Global Peace Studies for Sustainable Development in Africa webinar series. So I'm glad to be with you today. Thank you. And you've had a busy summer, haven't you, George? We've, and yes, he that's organizes right. brilliant webinars every week, which uh, most of us try and get to. So he's doing a superb job. And we're gonna discuss Africa, it's on the agenda a bit later. So thanks, George. Okay, uh, Christian, go for it. Welcome. Hello. Thank you very much. Welcome to you all. My name is Christian Kirsch, and I don't know even how I deserve the honor to be part of the World Intellectual Wisdom Forum. This is such a threatening meeting that I have almost, uh, let's say, sweat on my forehead, I must admit, because and I don't feel as an intellectual, not as a wise person. I just try to use an other way to peace, just uh, in, uh, in not just demanding we need peace and this must be better. I want to do it with a history and a story we know from ancient Greece with the Delphic games, which are peace oriented. And this is the reason that uh, Thomas and I came together. And I very much mm, feel honored. And thank you, Thomas, for uh, being with us as head of the International Delphic Academy. So this is for me just the beginning. And I'm the learning one from you all. Well. And you're in Berlin. Um, I'm uh, in Berlin, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, we found so, the Delphic movement. This year, we are 30 years young. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, that's on the agenda. We're going to discuss what we can do with the Delphic um, movement, you know, later on on the agenda. So we'll, we'll pick your brains then. It's very important. And there's some new things bubbling. That's exciting. Okay, Elif, your turn, madam. Hello. You'll have Hello, to unmute Thomas. me. 
Okay, I'm so honored and, uh, you know, delighted to be with you, uh, all of you. And thank you, Thomas, for inviting me. And uh, I am right now uh, in uh, European Peace Museum with Thomas, just downstairs, <laughs> it's upstairs. So it's another honor and pleasure. Uh, if I'm um, in trouble, I will run upstairs and, you know, <laughs> we will fix things. So thank you very much. I uh, originally come from the uh, United States of America, born in Talasi, Florida, but I live in Turkey, in Didim, uh, which is where the Apollo Temple is. So it's uh, about three, four kilometers, uh, my house to the Apollo Temple. It's a... Um, Tremendously nice energy. And I am a little bit uh, into the energy uh, issue more uh, because I have a channeling uh, ability. It's, uh, it's sometimes a gift and sometimes a curse, unfortunately. And uh, I'm here to uh, learn a lot from you all. Uh, thank you very much. Right. And we met, Elif and I met, at the International Peace Research Association conference back in 2014, 10 years ago, um, apparently. Uh, she remembers me. <laughs> 10 and, years ago. Yeah, yeah. And like how time flies, doesn't it? So it's nice to reconnect. And Elif is, yeah, doing some important work. We'll, we'll talk about a bit Thank later. Thank you very much. Um, right, Lester. Hello, sir. Your turn. Hi. Hi. I hope everyone's doing well. Great to be with you folks. Um, you know, I was thinking about uh, what it means to be an intellectual. And it, it says, it's intel. Like we keep telling ourselves stuff, right? Um, it's not a big deal. We get Some of us get paid to do it. And it, which I do, I'm, I'm a sociologist at George Mason University. And we're just outside of, of this nation's capital. Um, the seat, the, the, the seat and originator of much of the world's problems, uh, but also um, a nation filled with people from all around the world, which is what makes America great. Um, well, I should stop there. Well, no, that's great. I hope you had a good summer, Lester, and uh, had a break. Did you get a holiday somewhere? I hope so. I don't know. It just, you know, by now I should know summers are always too short. I'm always shocked when they end. Oh, ah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, welcome back to school. Okay, Gavork, hello. Greetings to you, sir. Hello, everyone. Uh, from Armenia, I greet uh, all of you. And uh, sorry that I uh, couldn't participate in, uh, in the last uh, meetings. I am um, a representative of the forum uh, in Armenia. I am lawyer, human rights uh, defender, and uh, during the recent years, mainly I'm dealing with uh, human rights and uh, peace education. Perhaps uh, this is enough. I yeah, know. no, there'll be plenty of opportunity to speak. And you were in South Africa at the World Education Conference, weren't you, Gavork? Um, and you were on that committee, I believe. So there's things there to share um, a bit later on. We need to hear from you about all that. Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, Meki Nagel, your turn. Yeah, thank you so much. I just listened to your... Um, um a talk on uh, being a dru druid this uh, oh, druid yes yes the druid, or druid, druid of yeah. deutsch <laughs> so i i come from the finger lakes region the uh, on an, the unceded territory of the onondaga nation um upstate no what is now called uh, or central new york uh, where the first um democracy happened amongst the confederacy the five and then six nations um, of uh, really unending peace till the colonial conquest uh, destroyed that um, uh, beautiful vision and reality. And uh, I teach philosophy. I'm the head of it. Um, yeah, I'm 
have so many hats now. Um, department chair, I have to run to a meeting very shortly, unfortunately. Uh, so I, I leave this meeting early. I'm also the chair, uh, director of an ethics, peace and social justice center. And uh, rather than uh, my least favorite thing now is being a public intellectual. Um, and my favorite thing is to be a healer. Um, I, I'm, I'm with the Druid way and my summer vacation was spent in Utah on a lavender field, you know, dabbling with essential oils, which are awesome for healing. And I yield. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. We love philosophers, Becky. So welcome. Uh, join the club. Yes. Um, Dr. Pietro, nice to see you. Um, greetings. Do introduce yourself. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Nice to see you too, Thomas. Good evening, everyone. My name is Pietro Uzo Chukumakli. I'm from Nigeria. Uh, well, I hold many caps, but I'd love to introduce myself as a Rotarian. So I'm in charge of Rotary Peace Building Efforts in Nigeria. I'm the chairman of um, Rotary Action Group for Peace Nigeria Chapter. Um, I, I heard Lester introduce himself and mention Judge Mason. I'm aware that Rotary and Judge Mason are working together on a new intervention. So um, uh, we are working on that here in Nigeria as well. Uh, well, my duty basically is to coordinate Rotary's human security efforts for peace building in Nigeria. So I'm in touch with the six districts of Rotary International here. And that means I'm in touch to over 15,000 Rotarians. And mm -hmm. uh, together we coordinate these large numbers of persons to implement several grassroots peace building efforts to of course, address Nigeria's multiple issues of peace and security. So it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I've known Thomas for quite a while. We met on one of the Rotary call sessions. I think the India Pun uh, program. Yeah, and since then, we've been in touch. Yeah, yeah, it's a pleasure, yeah. really. Thank you. Yeah, nice to see you again. And um, so Pietro is helping with the Commonwealth Interface Network in Nigeria as well. So, um, you know, I've been trying to get you and George together. So when we talk about Africa, we'll we'll give you both a slot there. It's important. Um, so bear with us. Okay, Inga, greetings, madam, from Norway. Hello, you'll have to unmute. Yes, greetings from Norway. Um, hi to everyone. Um, I live on the, in a small city in the Northwest coast with the name Molde. M O L D E, and uh, I've been working back in the days um, as an intern at the Norwegian Peace Institute. And uh, today I don't have a hat on, uh, uh, Thomas, but uh, today my hat is also as a co-founder of World Climate School. And um, mm -hmm. some of you may know that I've been introducing myself in in the reference to uh, the Oracle Osiwa in Egypt, as I've been working in Siwa, um, Dordogne, Siwa, and Delphi. So I'm very happy to see Thomas here as well. Um, yeah. You're on our Delphic Academy board as well, Inga, so. Yes, and... I'm on the Delphic uh, on the yeah. board and also on the, on the Peace Garden. And yeah. I live in the City of Roses in Norway. And uh, I think yeah. this, the cultivation of peace, how we, can move that. I also know quite well the Onondaga nations with uh, Orion Lions, who I met already in in year 2000 and before that. So it was a very impactful uh, meeting. Um, Great. And yeah, I'm, as part of her summer, Inga Meta came here with Alexander Bohane. They spent time visiting the Peace Museum. And, yes. Um, we had good chats about arts and how we can use art and culture for peacemaking. So there's yeah. a lot of you know important conversations. Okay, thank you for joining us. And um, and now some art. Would you like to introduce yourself? Your turn, please. Uh, some art, uh, Shum Art uh, is the uh, name of my association. Greetings from Serbia. I'm Yelena Simic from Serbia, from Belgrade. Okay. Uh, uh, also a very good friend and co-worker and uh, with uh, Miss Alif. Uh, we are together in uh, one program that is uh, 
related to the knowledge book and also to the uh, ordinance. Uh, I'm uh, by vocation art historian. Uh, yeah. Now I'm doing my PhD in it's art history. Uh, and the main uh, uh, scope of work, what, what I'm doing is trying to uh, connect um, art and culture with uh, different um, sectors. And also I'm working within um, uh, several European and international projects, uh, connecting young people uh, with the true form of art. And Alif knows about that a lot. Uh, and I'm firstly, I'm very, very grateful and honored to be among you. Uh, Elif told me about you, Thomas, and about your work a lot. And I'm deeply, deeply honored to be among you all. Thank you. Thank you. So it's our pleasure to welcome you, Yelena. And um, I've seen some of your talks with Elif about the OM talks and you know oh thank you oh thank you oh, good thank stuff you. breaking new thank ground. you thank yeah. you and really. i'm a great fan of um belgrade i've spent time oh, there really yeah oh, as you... part of my undergraduate history degree i did balkan history in depth oh. i won a prize <laughs> at the university of london for balkan history because the idea is it's so complicated if you can uh... understand the balkans you can do world history uh, so you can you, you will understand the, the world history. history when you understand the Balkans. Believe yeah, me. Yeah, so that's, that's <laughs> we, are, my yeah. we are not stay, still in that uh, uh, way of understanding who we are and what we are doing <laughs> in general right. here. Okay. Believe me. Okay. Thank you so much for joining thank us. You. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's hear very briefly then from Shore and from Meki. Um, because I know you two have got to both go, and we want to hear from your wisdom, please. So. If we can hear Shori first and then Meke, if you can tell us a bit about your work with, um, you know, indigenous philosophy, because you've been working in, in Africa. So Shori, what are you up to in um, in Ohrid, the seat of the Struga Poetry Festival, which I and my guys as a poet have been to three times. It's the best poetry festival in the world. Ohrid is absolutely yeah. beautiful and you're all welcome. And I'm so happy to see, um, so Mart from Belgrade, uh, <laughs> yes, Zdravo. Um, so uh, yes, being in North Macedonia is lovely here. And also so happy to see George here from Tanzania. That is so close to my heart. I worked for a number of years in Iringa in Tanzania. And uh, yes, so um, my, uh, I uh, just briefly just wanted to share some of the um, wisdom and insight that I came across recently when I attended two Baha'i summer schools, one in Budapest recently and the other one in Gdansk. And, um, and, uh, and this is what exactly the theme of the summer school was. And there were four concepts that we came across that for me was very, um, uh, really the uh, um, the basic principles if we want to have <laughs> world unity and world peace and uh, so I'm going to go very briefly I know uh, Thomas I, I want to be very brief uh, very quickly through these four principles um, and then uh, put it out there and in the future we can go in depth or if we could we could have some um, coming together beside that to do some studies around that. And the first principle that is um, um, really in, uh, the core is that principle of the oneness of humanity. And, and that, you know how it is that if we build, a, imagine we building an aeroplane without taking into account the law of gravity, what's going to happen? Is going to crash, and we 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 can build another aeroplane without the law of gravity. It crashes, and yet we are building our civilizations without this inherent law of oneness of humanity. And of course, it's going to crash again and again and again. And that's the um, the core principle um, of the Baha'i faith 
that um, we were explore, exploring leading to this uh, principle of the oneness of peace, that this oneness of humanity, you know, we may say, okay, yes, but is a very deep and profound issue and is a, is a law of humanity. And without that, of course, we, you know, we cannot move forward toward any world peace. Um, and, and the second principle that is, again, um, one of the cores for this world peace that we are uh, working toward is, um, is the, the, the principle of the no nobility of humanity. And, um, and I'm going to read this passage, see if it makes sense. Um, there's a passage from the Baha'i writing again, and uncritical assent is given to the proposition that human beings are incor incorrigibly selfish and aggressive, and thus incap incapable of erecting a social system at once progressive and peaceful, dynamic and harmonious, a system giving free play to individual creativity and initiative, but based on cooperation and reciprocity. Dispassionately examined, the evidence reveals that such conduct, far from expressing man's true self, represents a distortion of human spirit. So the the state of the world reflects a distortion of human spirit, not its essential nature. Our essential nature is nobility, however, there has been a distortion. And so, so that's very another uh, pivotal principle leading us to this oneness of to this world peace. The third one, again briefly, the third one is that right now material civilization is up here, but the, if you like, divine spiritual uh, education civilization is down here. There is this gap. And um, again, and I'm going to read this briefly because that really um, explains it. No matter how far the material world advances, it cannot establish the happiness of mankind. Only when material and spiritual civilization are linked and coordinated will happiness be ass assured. Then material civilization will not contribute its energies to the forces of evil in destroying the oneness of humanity. For in material civilization, good and evil advance together and maintain the same space. That was very sort of um, enlightening for me. For example, we have the material civilization that we can build the most enormous, most wonderful, amazing things. But because the spiritual um, education is not balancing it. We are using that in destroying, using it to make more at most advanced weapons, for example. So we need to have the, these both spiritual and material advancing together. And the fourth one, just briefly mentioning here, the fourth one being the whole principle that um, this is a very critical time in human history, and it is a, it is the coming of age of humanity, and that can explain perhaps what's happening. That the human race stands on the threshold of maturity. If you can imagine, we are at that stage where the um, caterpillar is becoming the butterfly, is starting to gorge and gorge and um, that principle, the principle that we are going through right now, the stage of adolescence of humanity. So world unity is fine because we are at this 
stage of adolescence of humanity and we will pass through this stage and we will reach the stage of maturity where we will be taking responsibility however um, the intensity of that depends how much we work together like this group to raise the consciousness so i'm going to stop here right. and okay well thank you very much shari that was very succinct for principles um i expect they'll come up you know um everyone i'm sure people on this call we will all agree with them we might have slightly different language but um you know they're all important and we should try and try and get discourse on all of these um so thank you and uh okay let's move to meki who's joining us from uh, new york you i know you have to go to a chair a meeting don't you in the philosophy department so right. do uh, that's very important we honor that work so just thank share you. with you with us some of your wisdom um right. Yeah. It's even more high stakes. It's a provost meeting. So I, I'm a minion there um, being told how to do things on sabbatical leaves and, and anti-racism, all good things, very important. And my, my work basically, Ludwig Ubuntu uh, dovetails very nicely with the Baha'i faith, right? And I have five stages, not principles. There's only really one principle, the highest one, which is oneness, yeah? So... <laughs> Um, and it's, it came together through a 20 year sort of struggle um, journey of working myself out of the prison system to uh, out of punishment to, you know, what could we do to get uh, um, better together. And obviously it leads to a virtue ethics that's steeped in the in indigenous practices the world over. Right. And spirituality or religions you know that are not hierarchical um but really in a, in a what i call the zomian way it's kind of a misspelling of james scott anarchist uh, kind of history of explanation what he calls zomia which is borrowed from a german whose name i've forgotten um as a colleague just uh, reminded me and it's in, instead of seeking out war you know of defensive war you just take off to the hills Right, you you do not go into combat. You do not um, go into the czar or whatever the uh, empire's army. So he, he studied Southeast Asia mostly, but we have maroon communities all over the Americas. You know where there's a swamp, there will be people who run away from slavery, from from indentured servitude, from the masters and the gods. Right, so. Um, and the focus here really um, is, uh, you know, I, I mentioned Ubuntu as a as a way of um, succinctly put together, you know, what oneness entails and humanity. Uh, it's often, I think, mistranslated as a person, a person is a person through other persons recognizing you. I really want to go away from that Latin root of things of masking in front of the court um, to humans right of uh validating our humanity and our interconnectedness with all relations sentient and rocks and what have you and and trees of course i also mentioned the trees in the final chapter um and it goes away from well you know what do we do with the worst of the worst um you know shouldn't there be still prisons i'm like i'm an abolitionist i'm also a law abolitionist and I teach philosophy of law now. It's uh, always so much fun to check out <laughs> with the students of, you know, do we really need uh, legal confinement, yeah, to put us in order? And just finally, in my diffuse thoughts here, I'm really taken by the notion of nested care because so much of this colonizing thought on imprisonment, on retribution, it's uh, warfare, it comes from a very shock and awe kind of childhood, which I have also experienced. Being put away, you know, mammals need 24 seven close touch. I didn't get it, right? Uh, and uh, um, the colonizers coming to the Americas certainly didn't get it, were appalled that indigenous people carried their children, never spanked them, 
never forced them to do anything, you know, completely spoiled, rotten, <laughs> right? And, and they grow up as more peaceful beings, you know, not being out of sorts. So there's really lovely work done in positive psychology now and social psychology, um, specifically Dacia Navais of Indiana University and George, you had her also um, as one of the uh, speakers. And uh, so it's, this is a beautiful community. We all gather um, in with love and respect, admiration, um, and, you know, really forging a new dignity perspective for all. And with that, sorry, I have to yield and I have to fly away. So <laughs> I hope and some of that makes sense. Otherwise, you know, before you go, Mickey, yeah, just yeah. one last thought. Yeah. Um, because we'll be discussing the Delphic Games and the Delphic Academy yes. a bit later. Mm -hmm. Just, um, and we have a guest who's living by the Temple of Apollo. Mm -hmm. I and just I want to say to that. Delphi myself. Yeah, let's not forget that Europe has its own indigenous spiritual traditions going back to Orpheus and Pythagoras. Yes. And we had our own um, way of dealing with conflict nonviolently, you mm -hmm. know, and um, a more loving, ludic kind yeah. of culture. And that part of the Delphic Academy, I think, is to revive that within within philosophy departments, within that. academia. That would be you know, People yeah. like you and and colleagues and Lester and all the rest of us. Let's let's so anyway, I just want to give you that. Suggest it to the Provost. Okay. <laughs> if there's a classics department, they're welcome to join up with our Delphic Academy. We want spies in all classics departments. Right. We wish. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you Good. so much. Yeah, okay, that's... bless you. Thanks. Thanks for Thank coming. You. Thanks Great. so much. Bye. Okay. Um <clears throat> now thank you. So look, we we I did invite um the author of the shock doctrine to come, Naomi Klein. I sent her a polite email to her department in Vancouver, British Columbia. She's not replied. I don't know. Uh dear, you know, intellectual superstars, <clears throat> you have to go through layers of stuff. And um so I'm I'm I don't think she's on the call. Anyone hands up, Naomi? No. But her work is brilliant. And I just, if you haven't read The Shock Doctrine, I just wanted to start with this because, you know, it's seminal work. Um, she was a young academic when she wrote it. And her argument is that capitalism has become deformed and depends on shock um, to, to create profits out of suffering and war and violence. I mean, it's a horrible kind of thought. I think it goes back to a, a total lacuna in Marx's work. He never talked about war and peace at all. You know, we all assume he's on the side of peace, but actually he refused to go to a peace conference invited by Victor Hugo in Geneva. He said, no, no, I don't want peace. I want class war. I want victory of the working classes. He was a warrior guy. And so, <clears throat> so whether it's from the kind of Marxist left or the, or the kind of right, righteous capitalist right, this war system is a shock system. And how can we unthink it? So that's really, I mean, I'll keep trying. If any of you know Naomi Klein or know a way to get her to drag her to the table, because she is talking to some people about what's going on in Gaza. You know, she's totally against it. She joined the New York um, encampment of students at Columbia University, opposing, and Toronto as well. So she's, you know, she's on the side of the peace people. But I'm not sure she needs to write a sub subsequent work. And the thought I want to hang over our meeting, we can discuss it as we proceed, is, you know, what we need to create a counter narrative, a shock of joy and awe, of love and awe, that is as strong and as beautiful and vibrant and, and more attractive, you know, than the current death and killing. Um, you know, every day Netanyahu bombs somewhere else, you know, and it gets all the news and everyone's focused. We're in, we're in horror and shock. Well, we need to, we need to do something, don't we? That, that, uh, and that's where the Delphic Games and other kind of projects come in, I think, um, <clears throat> and the arts. Okay, so that's really that was just a sort of introduction. Um, now let's let's turn to Lebanon. Um, I did invite a Lebanese friend of mine, Miriam. She hasn't come so far, sadly. But if anyone wants to, you know, any views um, on what's happening in Lebanon, um, uh, you know, feel free to take it away. Um, uh, who would like to go first? 
um, put your hand up, you know. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I'm I'm just watching appalled, really, that why haven't, why can't the international system have a mediation service in place to solve these conflicts? Why is it left to this barbarous kind of, it's like boys in a playground beating each other up. Where's the headmaster? They should intervene. You know, um, I've been a teacher for years. You don't let it get this bad. You intervene. Uh, or the school gets shut down. Um, I mean, are there not rotary clubs in Lebanon and Israel? I believe there are. Why aren't they doing it? You know, um, and so that's really, I'm just, um, uh, and and I mean, I'm sure that Hassan Nasrallah was, was a fierce fighter, but he had his religious beliefs. He was a Shia a Muslim, um, a man of, you know, high learning. He was he was trained by scholars. You know, he was a learned man. And he, I've got a message from him beyond the grave. He said <clears throat> this. He said, with respect to us, briefly, Islam is not a simple religion, including only prayers and praises. Rather, it is a divine message that was designed for humanity. And it can answer any question man might ask concerning his general and personal life. Islam is a religion designed for a society. You know, so he's coming, he was coming at his role in leadership in this group um, as a Muslim thinker, sage. He didn't want to be a warrior. He would much rather teach theology. But in Islam, you have to step up and defend your people. It's part of, the, you know, your mission, your duty, actually. And... Um, and what I'm concerned about from the behavior of the Israeli Defense Force um, elites, cabal around Netanyahu, it's like they want a war with all of Islam. Mm -hmm. They won't accept Islam's right to exist at all, period. You know, they declared war on um, the Palestinians, who are both Christian and Muslim. They've declared war on um, now Lebanon and a constant verbal war against Iraq, um, Iran. Mm -hmm. and Working with America, they, they destroyed Iraq, Libya, mm -hmm. you know, you name it. So as an interfaith peace worker, I want peace between Judaism, Christianity and Islam. I'm very disturbed to see if one group doesn't want to discourse and just wants to win militarily. You know, I find that very disturbing and we should we should we need to call that out and name it and as the coordinator of the Commonwealth Interfaith Network. I know that's not what the British culture wants. We have millions of Muslims happily living in Britain with millions of Christians and, and Jews, you know, and Hindus and Sikhs. Um, we were a multi-faith society. So I cannot understand what, you know, this, this war on Islam. Um, am I wrong? Or is that just, what do you think, um, Sean? You're, you're watching it from Ireland. How do you see the Lebanese thing? What are the Irish saying? Oh, yes, Thomas, uh, that's a great uh, overview you've given. Um, we, Because we're a small country, I suppose we have a different perspective on it and given a, a different history as well. I mean, we're very saddened by that conflict spreading like that. But I, I can't, I don't know if we have anything specific to say, to say, are they uh, not Irish peacekeepers on the Lebanese border? There were, weren't there? Yes, but in one of the organisations I'm a member of, there's a, 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 there's a an ex army Irish peacekeeper who spent a number of years in the on the in that Lebanese uh, assignment, and he's very critical of the UN. He said that they're there and they're there facilitating. I don't want to get into too much detail, but he thinks they. UN peacekeeping force in the Lebanon is facilitating Israel and they've been doing that for the last 20 years and they should pull out, the UN should pull out because anyway, that is slightly different <laughs> arguments. Um, just, uh, no, I don't really have that much to contribute to, you know, what, has, what hasn't been said already in the different um, interpretations. Okay. James. Um, Oh, let's move to James then, who I know the Middle East is one of his big issues, and we're discussing Lebanon. You right. joined us at the right time. What's your take on Lebanon from a British perspective? Well, and what can we do to, to stop this madness that's going on, this uh, well, potential war? Uh, what we can do, I, I, I <laughs> can only suggest that as a Ministry of Peace uh, person, I hate to have to say 
that we need a military intervention planted in Israel, rather like the one that's planted in Lebanon now, and uh, which is called the UNIFIL, as you probably have already discussed. Uh, and that has, it's if ineffective, admittedly, but it has the responsibility to represent the United Nations with arms so that it can intervene. And it has, it did do so in 1986. I know someone from the Chinese embassy who was there and they felt almost powerless to do anything. And so, it, but it needs that kind of intervention. That's the only thing, as far as I can see, that the Israelis are going to listen to. They're not going to, they're not going to have a peace deal. They don't want peace. They, they want Lebanon. They want to destroy any kind of opposition to their occupation of the holy, what they call the Holy Land. And right. uh, so the UN should should think of getting a peace team together, an intervention force, is what you're saying. Yeah. Yes, I'm afraid yeah. so. And okay. it'd have to be massive. You know, it would, it would have to be big mm. enough to take on the Israeli IDF. Right. OK, well, uh, Turkey springs to mind. We might come back to that in a minute, uh, Elif. And I were discussing this point a minute ago because yeah. Turkey was the superpower of the region. And as a member of NATO, if if it put up its hand and said, OK, we'll we'll be part of a peacekeeping force with Ireland and Canada, you know, um, then we're talking. We have some substantial weight there. Yeah. Um, and but, you might be right. Susan, you've got your hand up. You, what do you want to say? <laughs> I know I'm not a big intellectual, but I do know that America, as long as it's complicit, that it's it, this is never going to end. We just sent 40,000 troops uh, and also, um, boy, there's so many things I want to say. <laughs> Where did you send 40,000 40, troops? Where have they gone? I think they're in Israel. We have a lot in Jordan, but I think also in Israel because Derby, uh, the State Department spokesperson, said he when someone confronted him with that, he said, uh, yes, but I don't know the exact numbers, but he did. And then we've got a big ship in the port there that uh, that can attack also. Again, there's oil underneath Palestine, so that's another whole issue. I went and saw the Pentagon. I did a tour of it right after 9-11. And I said, are you ready to go to and are you already planning any other wars? And they say, Israel keeps pressing us to do Iran. So that's the final uh, target. But I saw the president of Iran on Fareed, which is CNN. I like him. He's very intellectual. And he said the president was saying that there's that they don't want to enter any war, that they want to have negotiations again and that they're easing. He is not for women with that strict burqa and all that. He said that it takes a long time to um, to bring about this change. And so. You know, if that is true, uh, you know, America is saying, oh, yes, 24 seven, we're trying to uh, negotiate. At the same time, they just gave another eight billion yesterday to uh, Israel. So it's very upsetting in this whole APAC made up of rich Jewish businessmen that can either get you in office or, or pummel you in the public eye. It It is it's so discouraging. You can call, I call so many Congress people, but you wonder if little phone calls can work. Uh, I'm not sure what that last uh, man was suggesting with the UN. You hear those speeches in the UN and so many countries want them to get the hell out of Gaza, but it's a, it, for Israel, it's about winning, which they will never win. They want everyone to put down their arms and they will rule and they want to expand their territory. And somebody in Israel, oh, there's a man who, and from Israel, I heard him speak. He did an editorial on the whole, on the nationwide paper, newspaper there saying, when is enough enough, Israel? And, you know, really, he's probably going to be arrested for his editorial article. Um, but he just said they want to win and they're never going to do it, too. That's what he was well, saying. Well, there's, there's a lot of... That's my mouthful. <laughs> thank you. No, Susan, thank you so much. There's a lot of... Um, important stuff in there and we all need to get some homework done we i mean marx said all the philosophy begins with biblical criticism um 
and uh, Feuerbach, who, who inspired him, a German intellectual. You know, in those days in the 19th century, you started by critiquing the Bible as non-historical. It's a non-historical document, and you have to reconstruct it in the context when it was written, which is, you know, 4,500 years ago, you know, et cetera. Um, and if you do that, if you, if you, once you realize that, then you can have some intellectual discussion between Jews, Muslims, and Christians, because at the end of the day, we're all human beings. You can have a humanist approach to theology and religion and, you know, the dictates of God uh, variously seen. Until you do that, if you actually literally believe the Bible word for word as a literal word of God, then it's a recipe for continual perpetual war. And, you know, th this is... So that's the first thing I think we as the World Intellectual Forum need to sort of say, that that we would appeal to intellectuals in the region to de-escalate this, this theology of, of warfare. Um, because, you know, the speech Netanyahu gave justifying the, the mass slaughter of 42,000 Palestinians because it's they're the children of Amalek. You know, like, this is just ridiculous. If the British reinvaded Ireland and started killing them all because Cromwell came back from the grave and said they're all papist, you know, evil people and we should massacre them. I mean, no, that was that was many hundred years ago. Since then, we had an enlightenment. <laughs> and Spinoza <laughs> kick-started it with his biblical criticism. And then we had the whole of biblical studies. What I want is a new enlightenment. I want Kant to come back. And it doesn't seem to have filtered through into the corridors of power. Um, Elif, what, what do you think about Turkey's intervention? Uh, we talked about this. Do you think uh, yes. how, how they see it in Turkey? Oh, yeah. Actually, I have uh, many perspectives because I'm an American at the same time, and uh, I live in a uh, close to the war zone. Oh. Uh, so I understand the Western uh, perspective on the Middle Eastern war, and I also see it uh, in the territory, what's going on. Before uh, going into the you know territorial discussion, I'd like to uh, pinpoint something beforehand. Uh, if you don't attain, in terms of consciousness, the seventh dimension, which is a spiritual matter, of course, uh, you will always have a duality, always a good or bad, uh, dirty and uh, clean. You will have two sides. So that's why... Uh, we will have wars and conflicts uh, until we come to this uh, unity and unified reconciliation of uh, thoughts, ideas, uh, way of living. Also, we have a problem of allocation of resources in the region. People are starving. Uh, they have no time uh, to go to a consciousness, you know, to get education. They're just at the survival, uh, Bell's law hierarchy of needs. So we have different causes and different effects. Uh, when you live in the region and you observe, uh, other than, you know, just, uh, pro I'm not criticizing, I'm uh, embracing everything here, but we really do need to, as you said, Thomas, we need to do our homework first, thoroughly and uh, honestly, being also honest to ourselves, uh, there is uh, too much going on in the region. We cannot blame a person or we cannot blame a religion for it. It is a, a very complicated matter. I've been to Israel many times. Uh, I have some Jewish origin as well, some Christian origin as well. I have a Muslim name, live in a Muslim country, but I am a little bit beyond religion. And it is, uh, yes, understanding Islam, reading the Bible, okay, these are all very well, but there is a need uh, for a uh, ascended uh, understanding of the enlightenment, which will stop all the wars, which is, you are very right. We need to redefine the enlightenment. But while we do it, we have to take care of the really, the needs of the survival. I'm a mother and a grandmother. I am, uh, I, I'm, you know, in tears when I see babies dying there, but I am also in tears when I got uh, the scenes shot uh, 
the Israeli people or the hostages taken, I'm equally disturbed. We don't need it. So no. that's why um, something Please, can is I just, going to be... Can I just pause you? I just want sure. to pause you for a minute. Thank because you. Because our dear friend in California, Amina, has to go off to an important meeting. Oh. She's from Afghanistan and she's actively oh. working for um, a peace building center in America. And since you're an American citizen as well, I think we should let Amina speak just for five minutes because she's. Please, got to I would love to hear Amina. And then we'll come back to you after. Is that okay? Amina, please share. What have you Thank been up to you. over the summer? Because I know you've been busy. Thank yeah. you. Hello. Thank you so much, Thomas. And. Um, I apologize, Elephant. Thank you so much for no, giving me no. a few minutes before I jump off. Uh, actually, I, I'm about to join a Zoom for uh, advocacy for HR 1111, which, as Thomas mentioned, is advocating for a cabinet level U.S. Department of Peacebuilding um, to elevate peacebuilding to a cabinet level position and give peace a seat at the table of our government, which has been missing. And in fact, it's been part of the conversation of our government from the, since the founding of this country. But um, finally, this legislation that I, along with a group of um, people are trying to advocate for, is, uh, is basically uh, making that into a reality. And so um, it's been an uphill, uphill battle, battle at times, but we have this, this particular Congress in particular, we've had almost monthly uh, advocacy meetings with Congress. And just this month of September in commemoration of the International Day of Peace on September 21st, and for the last week and this week, we've had 22 or 23 meetings um, with members of Congress. And there's one about to start in just a, a few minutes that I'll be joining as well. And so we continue our work we continue to um, spread awareness about the bill. I tabled just, um, um, I, we had a booth at the International Day of Peace celebration in San Francisco um, this last weekend, um, representing the DOP uh, in, in the Peace Alliance, which is the organization I work with. Um, and uh, this was an event that was uh, sponsored or uh, hosted by um, a, a UN NGO, Pathways to Peace a great organization um and so they they allowed us to to have a table and spread awareness about the the bill so there was a lot of traffic that came in public got to know about it so i'm excited about being a part of that uh, so we continue our advocacy work but uh, i i appreciate everything you all said and i love you and everyone about uh, um, the you know what's happening with uh, with the interfaith conflicts um that that is um you know, faith or religion is being brought into the mix when it's about colonialism and, you know, and, and land land theft really is what it's about. And um, and so um, the solution, as far as solution, I know others talked about it as well. And I know, Thomas, you touched on this as well. Um, the easiest way, in my opinion, is for the U.S. to get involved, cut the supply of of arms and 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 support for the for for the war and it could end that that fast so the the fastest way would be is for the us to pick up the phone for biden to pick up the phone and make that happen uh, and so and and not give so much political cover to the zionist elite forces who are warmongers and are against peace um and just just the lebanon thing just quickly on that um uh, I, I'm not uh, an expert in the region and for, for the area, but um, I think it's a horrific disaster that in the middle of a peace talk or in the middle of uh, a ceasefire negotiation to spread this war to other regions is about the worst move you could take. Um, uh, and, and it is not good faith negotiations for peace and ceasefire mm -hmm. if you actually did that while the negotiations are happening. So uh, it's a really sad moment. And again, the easiest way would be for the U.S. to intervene and do something about it, pick up the phone for Biden to to just do a arms embargo. That's it. And I think that that'll be the fastest and quickest and most effective way of handling it, in my opinion. And last but not least, before I jump off, just wanted to mention, um, the, thank you, Thomas, for bringing up the shock doctrine by Naomi Klein. She's one of my favorite um, thinkers and authors, political authors. And I think this book nails the parallel between economic economics and politics and how they mirror each other at times. And one is used for the advancement of the other 
for a certain number of elite forces in the society. And she does such a beautiful job at that. So if anyone hasn't haven't read it, I would highly recommend that book and other books by Naomi Klein. Uh, so thank you so much, Thomas, for including that in this discussion as well. And with yeah. that, um, I know I Can have I to just ask off, one but... question. I mean, yes. just before you go, there's an international network of ministries of peace, which was yes. set up in London. Um, are you, do you have links to them? And could we not? Yes. That's based in Canada. That's based in Canada. It, um, correct, like correct. James is, is part of a project in the UK for this. Can't okay. we get more of these things like in Lebanon and Israel itself? Yes. Um, how, what are you doing with the international uh, link there? Um, there's a few of our uh, members. So they're kind of a sister organization to us and um, our campaign lead, Nancy Merritt, Kendra Mon. Um, and Anne Creeder, who's also works with the UN, they are they they are very highly active with with GAMEP, uh, as you mentioned, uh, which works an organization that works for establishing ministries of peace, as you said, across the world. And that's kind of our mission, and we are kind of a, in in some ways partners with them. They are an affiliate and partner with us um, as we advocate for their work as well and support. And them they just had well. a big conference in Nigeria, I believe, didn't they? Yes. Correct. I don't know if That's Pietro correct. was there. We'll ask Pietro in a minute if he knew about it. Um, so there are people I, bubbling away. And thank you so much for the work exactly. you're doing. Well, thank you so much. Sorry, I yeah, have to yeah. jump off to go join that advocacy meeting. Wish me luck. Yeah, <laughs> and, okay. and thank you so Good much. Day. Such a pleasure to see you all. Yeah, Bye -bye. nice to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bye-bye. Yes. So, um, Elif, we were hearing from you. Let's go okay. back and then... Uh, uh, In Inga's got a question. Yeah, if you want to interrupt, just put your hand up. Inga, what's your question? Go for it quickly. Hello. Hello. Um, okay. I should phrase it as a question. So what if it is the intellectual capacity that's the, stopping us? And if we go back to common sense the essence of compassionate reaction to what we see and hear. Um, and we just start bringing singing and culture to the forefront. What if we do that? <laughs> okay, so what if we come from the heart um, instead of just purely the intellect? Yeah, sure. Thank you. I think that's a very good rhetorical question. Elif, um, that gives you a chance to go on because you were about to talk about that. I will. I love the question, Inger. It is really an opening uh, of a new window, which we really need. And uh, we need essence power. This is called essence power, and it is coming from uh, cosmic uh, sources. Turkey is a region with uh, a sort Turkish is, you know, a territory, of course, the Anatolia, but uh, there is a channel uh, touching the earth, which is a cosmic channel. It is in Istanbul. It is moving to Balkans, then it will be in France, and then it will go back to the Celtic region, which it originally came from. And Scandinavia is a very uh, profound area. Uh, it is so... Uh, easy for you to speak uh, from the essence because you have the essence in the Scandinavian magnetic field. Everything is about the magnetic fields. No war, no peace is possible before we understand how the magnetic fields on earth operate. Yelena and I, we have a, you know, work uh, undergoing. That's maybe why we are here. But the uh, Let's just open a window on Turkey. Yes, cosmically, it is uh, well protected. And secondly, in the region, there are two forces. One is Israel, the other is Turkey. Uh, they know how to fight. And in the region, we know, uh, I'm a Westerner at the same time, uh, but uh, I think like a Turk and as a military, uh, Mediterranean and, you know, uh, Balkan and the Indus, Middle Asia mentality, I say uh, you cannot fight fire with a bloom with a flower. You have to fight fire with a fire, and the fact uh, brings us to the deterrence. 
you you can fight fire with deterrence. I perfectly agree with Dr. James Trink. Uh, if I'm okay. I'm sorry if I uh, misspell your name, no, but no. we need an intervention. We need some sanctions. Okay, it's nice uh, talking meetings and you know. Uh, okay, let Biden call. It's not going to happen. It's a wishful thinking, and we are wasting time and effort and intellectual capacity, which will be directed more, which is needed more to bring results, uh, because people are dying over there. They are starving. Have you, uh, you know, fasted? Uh, have you? Do you know the hunger? Mm -hmm. I know it. Uh, do you know uh, when a bomb explodes near you? Have you heard a bomb? exploding i heard it i was not able to hear for three months so if you have such experiences uh, you're more eager to bring results mm -hmm. and you know the essence power inger it is coming through force uh, either you bring it with an internal force like people are you like uh, precious diamonds on earth uh, we have friends from scandinavia and they're so uh like angelic uh, figures, when we listen to them, we say, oh, it's beautiful to be on Earth. Uh, <laughs> but on the other hand, we have some realities ongoing. Okay, it's, uh, And let's go back to the causes. If we really, really want to have an intervention, as Dr. James says, we really have to understand the causes uh, of what's. And the deterrence is very important here. No one can touch Turkey. If they touch, their hands are burnt. I know it as an American living in Turkey. Uh, don't ask me why. I mean, it is uh, very dangerous. So let's go back to the spiritual uh, maybe thing. Uh, I will go very briefly because I know uh, it's a very new subject. First, we have to understand that a new era is coming and the e new era is no longer tolerating any structure and the wars going on right now. Uh, unfortunately, with a lot of uh, casualties and uh, destruction, is a uh, destruction of the structures. A new birth is taking place. So the system, which is like a hardware, is collapsing. But we have the time of the ordinance. The ordinance is like the software working within this, uh, you know, system. Nobody knows about it. It's a program. And it will bring us to a peaceful area, but it takes a learning curve. The faster we learn, the less we suffer. So let's learn it, okay? This is our suggestion, and we have an ordinance manifesto. If I have time, I would uh, like to read it. Then the next uh, step comes to the harmonia. Uh, so it was system, ordinance, and harmonia. Harmonia is uh, where Inger is right now. Uh, that's where she is from. It's uh, Scandinavia. It's a... Uh, like an umbrella shedding light too. So it's angelic. It's the golden age. It's the light age. Uh, we are not there yet. Yeah. And uh, there is a, you know, duality going on, wars, peace, and peace is now a product of war, unfortunately. War is more popular. War is more profitable. War has more PR value. Peace doesn't. So we, our job, first job on the earthly uh, setting of knowledge is to make peace more um, attention grabbing. I call it borrowed interest. People has to have a reason why, why they should be peaceful. If I go and grab this, I have the power to grab it. Why would I be peaceful? We have to go back to the human values. And spiritual education, as our uh, Baha'ian friend was talking about, I was also working with Baha'is and in Haifa in Israel. Unfortunately, it's now uh, under the bombs. A beautiful garden. So uh, this is, hmm. uh, if you let me talk, I can talk until the morning. Too. No, so no, 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 that's fine. <laughs> I'm going to stop you there, Aleph. Thank Please. you so much. <laughs> okay. I wish there was time. Um, yeah, I will I post, I, I'll send details. Aleph has been working for many years with a um you know tradition in turkey i was invited to go and meet a woman called bulent churak who who channeled a famous book called the knowledge book which is a sort of um like a revelation from you know an update from the spiritual kingdoms if you want she's now 101 and it's a fascinating study um 
yeah. which makes all kinds of psychological, philosophical and scientific claims. We've been discussing that we need to get scientists involved in analysing this text and saying, you know, well, like, which bits are genuine, which bits are sort of made up. In my commentary on the Quran, I've had the audacity to do the same. I'm a critical intellectual thinker. I don't just accept revelations because somebody tells me they're revealed from a divine source. I believe in a human being. I have the right to use my intellect and say, well, is that a divine source? Or is it just sort of made up stuff? So I think, you know, um, there's, there's, there's some work to be done there around that particular lineage. But Elif is very open to wider perspectives. And we've been talking about the whole Delphic tradition of, you know, the seer that is in touch with the divine, the oracle, uh, the Sybil. And I actually know a chap in Israel um, who's part of our World Intellectual Wisdom Forum. He doesn't often come. He wrote a book called Future Intelligence. And his job at the Knesset was to say, is this legislation going to benefit the future? So what, you know, is bombing Lebanon and killing off this chap or bombing Gaza and killing 42,000 people, is that going to benefit the future of the region? I don't think you have to be a genius to work out. No, it's not. Nonviolent, peaceful negotiations and mediation would be much better, in my opinion. Um, I want to just give an update from our friend Maxime Comsier, a Palestinian member of this group who spoke at our World Peace Gardens recently. He runs a museum for um, like ecology in Palestine. He's an academic. He's part American citizen as well, like Elif, but he lives in Palestine. And from an ecological perspective, he's just saying there's such beauty in the region of Palestine and Israel. It's got amazing plants and rare botanical life and organic life and um you know he's been documenting it all and yet what's going on is desecration of nature destroying forests trees uprooting so from a green perspective this is why the green perspective and the peace perspective are the same and that's why i'm delighted inga meta's working with this um you know the green perspective of, of the climate change school so <clears throat> Can we briefly look now to Africa? Because um, we've got two colleagues. George, do you want to say a bit about your work? And then maybe Pietro can add about Nigeria and what you're doing concretely on the ground, because Nigeria's got interfaith problems as well. Um, what's happening in, in Congo and uh, Sudan, George? Anything to report peacefully? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Thomas. I wish that everybody, everything was peaceful there in uh, in Congo and uh, in Sudan. And actually, talk about Congo to begin with. We have uh, now another problem with which is Mpox, and uh, many people are really struggling with that that kind of disease, which uh, really mm -hmm. makes the whole um, you know skin uh, full of you know, well, I don't know how to describe it, but, you know, it develops into ulcers and so on and so forth. And so really terrible, it can be fatal. And that's happening actually in a region that also is also experiencing a lot of, you know, Ebola and other disease. So actually the challenge is, the question is, why is it always happening really, especially in Congo? And then we know that there's a huge presence of um, the UN, uh, but also some countries, particularly Uganda and Rwanda, are also there uh, trying to uh, loot, really, the resources that are available there. Of course, in uh, complicit with other um, Western powers. And so sometimes we think that there is a really a direct connection between these challenges we see in terms of health, uh, but also the resources that are there. Uh, and so sometimes it might be that these diseases are going to kind of continue uh, to persist in those regions, maybe as a way of also giving employment to some people because they'll be you know, supplying medicines and people. Um, so in a way, 
people are just interested in their own uh, enriching themselves at the expense of the people. And so the country that is otherwise very rich in terms of natural resources is losing out um, a lot. And, and so sometimes uh, what we see in, in Congo is also the same as what we see in other countries in Africa, but also in elsewhere, this kind of resource curse. When, when you are abundantly rich in natural resources, then you are also uh, more likely also to be affected by wars, conflicts. And I think also the same is applying in, in Sudan, where we've got two factions kind of fighting each other. And why? Because everybody kind of thinks about their own interests, but rather than the interests of the, of the entire population. And, and so for us, for example, in Global Peace Studies for Sustainable Development in Africa, we are discussing these issues. Um, but of course, I think we need also to go beyond maybe uh, just discussing and have some, some action, you know, taken some, um, some measures maybe. Um, and I think this is not only for Global Peace, but also many other uh, networks, organizations, uh, I think we need to, I think, build a stronger coalition of peace builders at a global level to be able to address um, issues that are happening even in local contexts, in, in, in a continental uh, contexts or local contexts. So I thank you. And of course, mm -hmm. I'm so glad to see many of the people who are also participating in Global Peace Studies, a webinar series. Uh, peace studies for sustainable development in Africa, where we meet uh, we meet every Wednesday. So I also invite you to please join us whenever you can and bring all these wonderful ideas. I think we should really develop this global coalition of peace builders. And yeah. uh, well, thank, thank you, George. Um, can I just share a thought from a philosophical fixture about act action? Because I was always having this argument with my mother. She was always saying, "No, action, action, action!" Right. She was a Marxist. I, I just want to quote Fichte and say, thinking is also an activity. There is an important role for intellectuals and educators and academics. Getting the thinking right is what we should be doing. That's my view, you know. Uh, my mother was always going out and banning the bomb with marches and waving banners, you know, and that's great too. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with activists, but just remember Fichte's word, thinking is also an activity. And if you, can, if you can improve the subtlety of your thinking, if you can begin to tune into divine intelligence, you know, uh, which is a word for the kind of people that Elif uh, do that sort of work, uh, or Buddhists, mindfulness training, then we can begin to purify stuff. Uh, I'm just saying, you know, like we should be making contact with people in the Congo and in the Sudan who are working at that level. There must be uh, people. But anyway, no, I love the work you're doing, George. Yeah. Um, Piet you are right, Thomas. Definitely uh, you are right. And well, definitely our, our action is going to be based on our proper, clear thinking. Thank you that's, so much. That's kind of what I'm saying, yeah. So, Pietro, can we ask you to share from Nigeria? Um, did you know about this um, gathering that took place in the University of Northern Nigeria or somewhere about all these ministries of peace around the world that Amina was talking about? Just um, recently, a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago. I may not know that in particular because um, Nigeria has a cocktail of activities, so many to keep tabs on. Yeah. Both, just like you mentioned about thinking and action, both many that are well thought out and many that are just window dressing that are designed to just, as an avenue to just... um misappropriate or something. So there are lots of activities to I'll keep send you the link. On. Because maybe you can yeah. contact the people behind it. Um, is Excellent. there a ministry of peace in Nigeria? Do you get help from the government? Is there a ministry of any kind? There are lots of ministries in Nigeria, lots of interventions, like I said, and it boils down to sustainability. You know, when you come up with these beautiful ideas, it's about having a framework and the machinery to ensure that it's progressive, it's sustainable. 
it's not enough to just um have a one-off intervention and walk away. These things are culturally rooted, they're historically rooted, so it's not something you would just change in one event or even two or in a year. So the importance of progressivity and then that sustainability angle is becomes very, very, very important. And um, just like I was very interested in what Elif was saying about um, the structures being eroded and that the new normal or the new world order is an order without structures, you know. And uh, I think there are lots of school of thought that is thinking in that dimension and evidently is looking like it. Some even dread that perhaps we are retrogressing to colonialism or slavery. But the quasi version, it might not be as we used to know it, but um, increasingly seeing that the non-state actors are now getting more powerful than the state actors, so that that that's really a concern, especially for uh, third world countries and regions like ours. You know, I, I usually ask. Uh, I also like the analogy about fighting fire with fire. I usually ask what would happen to Africa if a certain country decides to to damn the consequences of sanction, which is a hoax, by the way, because, I mean, you can't sanction yourself. So if the group of countries are making the rules, what happens if tomorrow those group of countries decides to recolonize? Or, you know, who can stop them in Africa? The competition, the the China affair in Africa and the concerns with with all the all the balkanization and the land grab and the resource competition and all that stuff. What happens if some group of country thinks that they no longer have a stick in their pie and needs to grab it by force? We saw how France was forced out from neighboring country of Nigeria. We also saw how Nigeria was being instigated to to go to war with the next door neighbor. You know, our foreign policy is uh, Pan-Africanism. We don't go, we don't fight wars with Africa, but we were at the verge of doing France a favor and throwing our our ideology, you know, to the sink because of, you know, without taking full cognizance of what that could have done to the country. Be that as it may, lots of activities are happening both covertly and overtly. And it's really concerning because it's the ones that are happening on the ground that is more concerning because there are lots of players. Players that are interested in the mineral resources, players that are interested in the governance architecture, players that all these players, none of them are interested in peace. You know, so the region is very much militarized by the day. The Sahel is militarized, is polarized. The, the resource competition is, is alarming, is underreported. Uh, the news, the mainstream media is all about Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, Russia, and all that. But a lot is happening in Africa that it, is worrisome. The genocides are coming back, you know, and it, it, it's a nightmare. So what we are doing in terms of action, I can tell you, uh, Prof, that I don't think is enough personally. I might be too critical. I might be too pessimistic, but I don't think it's enough considering the, the the gravity of things and the pace at which they are metamorphosing. You know, so I think um Africa, Nigeria, it's the multicultural aspect is also very, very uh, concerning because it's not just religion, it's not just tribe. Nigeria alone speaks we have over two hundred and fifty languages. Nigeria alone has over 500 tribes, so you could understand the plurality. It becomes very difficult to unify these factions, and every group has every reason, one reason or the other, to pick up arms against the other. So beyond the mainstream religion, the Christian Muslim that you have, that is underreported, by the way, and then the religious fanatics and the heresies and the blasphemy and then the assaults you see, how about the traditional institutions? You know, so there are cocktail of issues in this part of the world. And in all those chaos, there is also a resource war that is underground, fueling everything, evading peace, eroding peace, tearing down the this, this social fabric of the country. So indeed, I, I also like the idea of um, 
of putting the military in some of this, the UN military in some of these regions, starting with Israel to to balance terror in Israel. But we know it's not going to happen. Some of these are too ideological and practical because we know that um, some the, the supports Israel is getting. Likewise, here in Africa, the the the, the groupings, you know, it is also a factor that makes some of these wars to linger and seem controllable. They are not as hard as it seems, but then it's about the players and the actors that, that makes everything twice as hard, really. I think I would like to stop here, Thomas. Thank okay. you very much. No, um, thank you very much, Pietro. I just want to share one thing about Africa and then ask James to contribute. Um, I came across an interesting academic paper recently about drone warfare in Africa. There's lots of drone bases being installed in African countries. Um, it's a sort of, you know, the author, I can't remember his name, but I've got the paper. I've sent it to George, I think. Um, is that something happening in Nigeria? Are there drone, um, you know, is it, a, is, is it sort of the privatization of war? Are these drones being provided by private companies, uh, corporate sector? I don't know. What, what's going on in Nigeria and other African countries? Does anyone know? Um it, it it seems it's a new level of warfare, which, um, you know, the military industrial complex has invented, which destabilizes, you know, us even more than before. And nowhere in the world is really safe. We can all be taken out with with drones if we if we misbehave. So that I think, you know, keep keep your eyes on the ball there, particularly in Africa. So and elsewhere, everywhere. Yeah. Um, if you allow me, Thomas, uh, I'm working with East and African uh, Green Education University Network with 30 university connected. And my husband is from Zimbabwe, so I know quite well the southern part of Africa as well. And I've been working with the Nigerians and, and the French, uh, Francophone uh, Africa's, uh, Africans, and also I've been living in Egypt. So, so, so what I think now, the drone welfare uh, warfare is crucial. We have to take a stand on it. And for, from the World Climate School, we're doing it with, a, with working on AI and legislation and governance structure. There has to be rules in the game. It's very dangerous uh, avenue that we're on. And I have suggested that we should get this for the... the uh, the, 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 as the fifth pillars of the Statue of Rome. And to get it, it's the echo side and the, the war, way, uh, war uh, is all is criminal acts. We have to have this justice to be addressed. Uh, that's one of the, so it doesn't come with a nice plan for peace or a beautiful plan for peace or an evil plan for peace. We have to have a very elegant strategic plan that is putting us in some kind of not being in the standing at this point in history and looking backwards and backcasting. We have to create the future, and that is our assess essence, the creative skills that we have. So, so we have to come together in that oneness. For example, in in a slogan, uh, "War is bad for football." You know, <laughs> no, it's really bad for football. And I'm saying oh. this because I'm working with Hiroshima and we're having this 30,000 uh, football stadium humming for peace. And we call it the missing piece out of Hiroshima on the 10th of October in next in a week's time. So, so and it's a football stadium. And, and I think we have to make this elegant plan and we have to uh, do something that is really structured. We have to put laws and governance to, to warfare that is drawn and artificial intelligence together with, with yeah. um, uh, ecocide. So, so I think you, that yeah. is, that is my, funny. and the, the, the Nigeria, the, the, the oil industry in the Delta is a criminal act. Mm. The pollution that is happening in sure, a country. So we so, need so we, to we need to move beyond oil. We know that. So, um, yeah. Can I ask you to say share something about the conference in New York? There was there was the summit for the future. We were hoping Alexander Bohane would come yeah. and talk us about that. Have you heard from him? Do you know what you've read? The Pact for the Future. What do you I, think? I read. What they do? I read. The, you know the the it, the Pact is okay. It sounds like a 
uh, not an elegant, sounds like an evil plan, like a pact. Yeah. Um, but uh, what they say about the, the climate week after that took place, it's actually falling apart. There's nothing really coming forward. Um, what I'm seeing here is um, the Club of Rome coming forward with a very strategic uh, approach of the uh, top level uh, connecting to the grassroots, like a bottom up. Uh, and, and they're talking about uh, citizens assemble, that assemblies, like a transformative culture that comes from the grassroots that is having this, uh, the philosophical circles in the local communities. That's what it is, where we can have address complex problems with the philosophy, the, with the wisdom, with a legacy that we learn from each other from different ecosystems, which we can do today. So, so um, what can I say? Um, yeah, where is Alexander? Why isn't he here? Do you know? Did you hear from him? Not today. I haven't heard from him today. He he is. Um, um, is he in New York still? He's still in New York. I'll try to reach out to him. I think, I'll try and have a one to one with him. But, uh, what I like to like my energy is high. It's like like I think he's like, come on, people, let's do something. You know, we can do better. You know, and I, I if you address it from the Olympic Games, did it was it peace or was it war during the Olympic year, the Games this year? Was there any? effort to put down weapons, even with a galloping beautiful peace horse to, to, to Paris? No, nothing. Well, so we, that's, why, that's, why, that's why that's why we with the Delphi game now we can use this opportunity because mm. it's madness. And it, it, everybody sings it, you can see it. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually think I want to say something. I mean, we'll talk about the Delphi Games in a minute, but I do want to yeah, say something. But I, I'm going to um, share this football thing. War yeah, is yeah. hard for football. <laughs> I love that quote. Thing. Put it in the chat. Put it in I, the chat. Yes. I, I'm we'll all it. come. Coming for no. peace. We'll come. Yes, yeah. here it is. Um, okay. I, um, I found it. I put it in the chat. I want everyone to be get this, support these kids in Hiroshima with this. Yeah. We're going to come. We're going to, I, I've already registered, so I can share that link to people. Here, here it is. Um, the humming for about peace. the Delphic. Um, so just for those that don't know, I mean, Christian's been banging this drum for 30 years, bless him. He's a saint here listening. But um, the thing about the Delphic Games is countries were not allowed to participate if they were in war. There had to be a truce or a ceasefire when the Delphic Games are on. And it was the same officially with the Olympic Games. Now, what I think we should do, and I want to do this from, through the Delphic Academy, I want to put out a big like series of press releases, interviews with people, get it out in the public media. So an immediate global ceasefire, all the wars should stop. And let's reinvite or reinvoke the spirit of Delphi know thyself let's invest in education in self-knowledge which is what delphi is about instead of this ridiculous killing the wars have got to stop you know and so i think we can connect the two and we could do it in a powerful way with the media i know inga and other people on this call are expert at that so just to flash forward we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute okay but we we can because everyone's saying we need a ceasefire in gaza we need a ceasefire in lebanon but no one's actually doing it. So this is where, uh, forgive me for saying so, but this is where the gods have to intervene, if you want. Because <laughs> they were behind the Delphic Games. I mean, you know, how will you define gods? I mean, I, I mean, uh, that's another philosophical discussion for another day. But um, yes, because the media is just same as, same as, wars inevitable, keep going, you know, vote Tory. No, it's not. Right, um, let's move on. And can I turn to Ireland? Because... I want to talk about solutions. Um, we're talking about ethics and the morality of global governance and, you know, how we can change the system to be more sensitive to the real human needs here. Uh, Sean and the Irish have taken a step. So, Sean, can you tell people what you've done? What is this election has sent you and how can we all sign it? Thank, Thank you for thanks. doing it. Yeah. Very briefly, I know we're getting late in the time. Um, this um, Lex Innocentium is um, based on an ancient Irish law that was promulgated in the year 697. And it inspired us to re 
redo the law for the 21st century. So it's um, Lex Innocentium, the law of the innocents uh, for the 21st century. The original law was brought in to try and protect women and non-combatants in time of conflict right back in the 7th century, which is amazing. And so we brought it up to date and we brought we launched the law there last week in 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 the original town that the law was launched in 697 and the law the modern law the law we launched it makes war and this is a very basic thing three steps war is a crime against humanity no excuses war is a crime against the earth no excuses. War is a crime against the future. And that's what you sign up to. And that is a basis that we're trying to promote. We'll try and do it online now because we did it actually in reality at the original castle where the law was promulgated. So this law is a people's law. It's nothing to do with international because all the international laws to protect is in time of war. They're all there at the moment and they're not being, uh, they're being ignored. So we're just saying that this, maybe it's time for a people's law, a soft power bottom up. So uh, people in peace organizations around the world and people in, even not in peace or can sign this law online to say, this is what we where we stand and we can, Deal. I mean, it's only one contribution to a very complicated question about how to change the culture of war and the culture of violence to a culture of peace. And everyone here today, all those contributions are aiming at the same thing. You know, we are working for the same uh, end goal here. Uh, that this is our contribution. We're inspired by a law going back centuries way ahead of its time the first um, it was called the first geneva convention and it wasn't the second geneva convention in 1949 <laughs> to protect people in times of conflict and it, it, we're just trying to give people around the world to sign up to this law and it says um we were against the culture of war the culture of violence and we're moving in that direction we are the future and that, that's and you're bearing a time capsule Sean is going to be burying the original scroll with the signatures. Yes. In, where is it going to go, Sean? Have you chosen the place yet? Well, it's it's at the original, the second castle here in Ireland. What we just decided to do was to the people who came to on the day that we the the, the day the twenty first of September, yeah. International Day of Peace, when we signed the law, sixty odd people came to the castle, signed the law, and <laughs> those signatures are going into a time capsule for to not be open for a hundred years, and we'll have a message to the future saying at least. Whatever happens when it's opened, we and everyone on this um, <coughs> Zoom today and other people did try. We did try to protect um, the future. We did try to protect the earth. Maybe we failed. We won't know. We won't be around in 100 years time. But we're saying, well, here we tried. We did something. And Thomas, and other, you know, people who have who've been working for years and years and decades to promote peace, the culture of peace, and we're so far uh, away from it now with the wars that are going on at the moment and the, the breaking of international laws and the double standards and the hypocrisy in Europe over, you know, we were very quickly to condemn Russia and rightly so in its invasion. And then we just stand idly by when Israel does even worse, you know, and then the Sudan and other areas. So that, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. And the law will be online after today. I think we're today we're, we're actually getting our act together to put it online so we can promote it in three different languages. We only have three languages, but we, that's what we're aiming at. Well, so, last night, you. Sean, last night at the Philosophy Club I run here weekly, we had some more signatures. Elif uh, signed it, and we had a couple of others who've added themselves. So that's good. Thank you, Elif. Um, Thanks. And please be, uh, if Sean puts into the chat the, um, you know, the website, then watch it, and then you can sign it online. Please, everyone on this call, do so. It's a very worthy project. And um, I was just in Britain, and so we had a meeting in Poole, and a group of us signed it there as well on September the 21st. Um so let's let's turn and um, let's ask Christian to tell us a bit more about the Delphic Games, what your vision was, because you've been holding this vision for 30 years of rebirthing um, the Delphic Games. It, I mean, the world needs it now, doesn't it, more than ever? Um, 
do you feel optimistic about the future or should we just give up and let the warlords destroy the planet? What do you think, Christian? Well, at first, I never give up. That's the first statement I want to give, give to you. And I would like also to thank for the contribution of yours as a team. And uh, may I point out some trigger words from Inger Mette. Uh, she said, an elegant strategic plan is needed to attract, to draw attention, and it needs structures and strategy. And if we just recognizing what we what we miss, what we dream upon, it's not enough. We have to set up methods and then we have to control how realistic is it to get it done. And you were asking me how the Delphi games arise. It was, let's say, the, the intention of me to increase arts, culture and education because I recognized 30 years ago or more than 30 years ago that when I sponsored um, as a finance and economic consultant, I sponsored mainly Latin Americans and now um, uh, um, the, uh, the US Americans and then the British ones and Asians as artists. And I asked myself, What's the matter with the Europeans? Why they are not at stage enough visible? How, how come that the heritage, the legacy of Europeans are not performed by Europeans? Are they down the tube like we had ages where big people and, and uh, big communities diluted and minimized? Or do we have, or what is the reason? And I recognize that is after checking the education systems, it was the matter of education in the various countries that arts and culture has a limited importance in the curriculum of education. And if you don't start in a younger age, you don't develop peaceful skills, artistic skills. Nowadays, it's even uh, the case that uh, youngsters are uh, moving their mobile phone into, the, uh, into the, the schools. And I have the fear that creativity will be reduced if the so-called button pushers uh, forcing decisions which let's say, make your mind, your curiosity um, um, wide awake and curious. If this dilutes, we, uh, we have to come up with more innovative ways of education, what we want to educate. If we want to educate peace, and I learned the power of peace after I was drawn into the Delphic games and searched on Delphi on the three holy wars of Delphi of the, of the 12 tribes of Greece to own the place. And all of a sudden having holy wars and after three so-called holy wars, they decided, hey friends, we are stupid, let's unite Let's share the power, let's make business, and let's make it fun. Let's make it joy, let's attract those. You can just uh, attract by tricky entertainment or by curiosity. And so if we want to give heavy messages, philosophers are very important but if they sit in the driving seat, if they are writing the books, they forgot the sales part very often. The text design deludes the brilliant ideas because people see the block of text and say, oh my God, so much to read, I'm not used to it. And the scientists answer then, 
uh, Thomas, what the answer? Oh, well, we scientists, we are just used to it. That's fine, but we have to go beyond. And to go beyond the normal, to reach the crowds, we have to look for recipes, for strategies, like the Olympic Games, but for the arts, for culture, for education. Because it is a structure, as Mette said, without structure, without rules, without uniting under one umbrella, we will not receive the attention we deserve. Yeah, and, and you're hundred percent right, um, Christian. And thank you for all your, you know, inspiration to us. And uh, like, as I said earlier, I want every university on the planet to know about the Delphi Games, to sign up, to to get a sort of accreditation as a Delphic university, because they'll only get that if they have the arts and and you know culture, drama, a theater. Uh, dance, music, here, in the curriculum. Here, Thomas, sorry in to the interrupt. Curriculum. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. But this is another so-called project, and I'm not looking for project. I'm looking for initiatives which remain. And if we start replacing, let's say, a result with another project, then we never come to a conclusion. We have to focus. If we are not focusing, we delude our power. If we are not uniting our power, if we come up with new conventions, new universities, new congresses, this is just talk and no action. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, we're coming to the end of our meeting. I understand people have got um, other duties to perform. Um, so uh, what I suggest is we do is we go round and we say our last you know, few minutes because there's been a lot of words shared a lot of ideas shared. Um, and let me ask, um, let's go in, um, you know, George, why don't you start off and we'll go back round. Any, any reflections on what you've heard so far in this meeting? Any thoughts you'd like to share? Or, um, you know, thoughts for the future? Yeah, George. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much that we need this kind of collaboration um, where we think and act. And I think that's very important, of course. Um, I understand that thinking is also acting. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure meeting you all. And welcome to Global Peace Studies for Sustainable Development in Africa. I will send you a link. It's also already in chat, um, but you can also contact me directly or please through Thomas. Thank you so much. OK, thanks, George. And um, yes, I mean, there's a whole conversation about Africa and I was interested in what our Nigerian friend was saying about Pan-Africanism. It means that African countries don't fight African countries. And I know that in your conference this summer in Tanzania, you, you looked at the theme of Pan-Africanism and socialism in the Tanzanian context. And that's a conversation for maybe a, not a future meeting. You know, is uh, like pan Pan-Europeanism was supposed to be about that, and yet it's collapsing in front of our eyes. Um, Pan-Africanism, we hope it could lead to an ending of these wars in Africa. And anything we can do from Europe, you know, we will do. Um, I'm ashamed if France is, you know, uh, sort of getting involved militarily and stuff. Um, so let's keep in touch on that, okay, because we need to push for... Um, a proper pan-African and pan-European collaboration for peace, I would say. Um, so thank you. Um, um, okay, so Elena, Yelena, do do tell us, and tell us a bit more about your artwork in Belgrade. What, what are you doing? Uh, I'm an art historian. I'm, I'm more in, in a theory than a practice. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not a practitioner in, in art. Um, I would like to share something, but uh, firstly, uh, it is very important um, to discuss, uh, but it's um, what's most important to to act. And I'm uh, I'm uh, so with Inger that what she said <laughs> about action plan. We have there is there is always need for action plan, and we have to uh, structure. If I may say, we. Uh, structure and action plan, as uh, Alip and myself, we are doing in, in, in our uh, uh, scope of work. And one very important thing, I don't know, maybe Thomas, you know about that, 
there are some civilization on the Balkan called Vinci culture, which is um, descended from the Golbeki Tepe, Karakan Hepe, and, and other other ancient uh, 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 civilization. And it was in the fifth millennia BC, and it was a civilization with 2,000 years without any single war. Is it war achievable? Yes, it is. It depends on us. And they are working mostly with art and culture and trade. Uh, how we know that? Because uh, on the uh, archaeological site, there are none of the weaponry. They couldn't find any kind of weaponry or fort, forced deaths and so on and so on. Art uh, and culture are the utmost uh, level. Uh, they, uh, they're bringing utmost level of uh, frequency, pure frequency. Uh, and uh, uh, the art is the key of um, elevating the human consciousness uh, because it's, it is a barrier of the um, uh, easy uh, uh, transferring of information. Uh, and within the art and within the uh, uh, scope of working with art, we can do a lot of things. Uh, I'm doing with my with my students. I'm I'm working as a mentor and as a tutor with the young uh, painters, sculptors, new media, uh, and we're trying to pull children from this insane culture, which is wokeism, uh, uh, deeply spread in the in the Western culture, and it has to be one of the the uh, core uh, things that we are going uh, as as a society global society we have to do it to uh, um, help young people uh, to understand uh, that um, being different being uh, uh, on the spotlight on the social media is not not important that is our job as a senior uh, uh, citizen <laughs> I'm joking we are not seeing the silly in that manner but uh what we are doing right now miss L, I'm, I'm trying to be as uh, short as i can uh what we are doing right now it's uh something uh, you know thomas about the knowledge book about the, the this oh. uh, the, this um, very profound um uh, technological book it's not it's not uh, only a, a spiritual book and if if i may i would like to read uh it is seven uh, clauses of the ordinance manifesto, which is um, very important to understand our place. Could, uh, do you have them in electronic form? You could put them in chat. Yes, that, yeah, I will put it. But the first clause is liberty, equality, fraternity, sisterhood are the basis of true unification. And it's a period. It's a period. Uh, uh, believe me, it, uh, nothing else. Okay, no, uh, no, no, please. Please put them in chat. I, I wish you'd spoken earlier about this. No, no, never mind. Never time. mind. We, we, yeah. we are going to spoke about this in, in, in a different... Uh, we'll have reasons. other conversations. Uh, uh, yes. Can but, I just uh, clarify one thing? Though? I just want to say one thing, because I nearly did say earlier about okay. language and how words become corrupted and inverted and so on. Um, I, I said I think it's time for new enlightenment. And yet, and one of the words for enlightenment is to be awake. Um. And the African community used the term woke, meaning enlightened. It's for them it's a very it's a very honorable thing to say. If you say to somebody, ah, you're woke, brother, it's like you're, you know, you're speaking the same language of anti-colonialism, anti-slavery, and equality. And yet in 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 mass media discourse, this term to be woke then was inverted. Exactly. And turned into something terrible and we got to Bad. fight it. It's horrible. Leftism and so on and so on. Well, yeah. I, I just I just think that the, we need to step back from this and instead of waging war on woke, as you seem to be doing, my dear, I would ask you to gently step back from that, critically examine what is actually the issue at stake, Go back into the black sources of this this concept, and mm -hmm. how it was then weaponized by extreme right wing white fascists oh, yeah. in America. Oh, yeah. I mean, presumably oh, yeah. you know this. Oh, Are yeah. you saying you're siding with Steve Bannon and the white fascists who want to smash the black liberation movement? I I can't <laughs> believe that. You know, 
Although, so anyway, just I'm just saying a critical warning flash here. Yes, yes, yes. Do, oh, please do some homework and let's get um, collectively a bit more awakened on, on our use of language, okay? Um, but thank you very much for sharing. That's brilliant. Lester, oh, um, sociology of enlightenment, do you want to comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, well, Thomas was just talking about the enlightenments and I, I owe him a paper um it was like the you know the the students who come to me say well I'm 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 working on it you know, um but it's too overwhelming Thomas had this incredible course which I would highly recommend are you offering that again yeah it's available online people can register and tune in I mean I yeah yeah it was quite an intense thing wasn't it Am amazing you know, taking the the concept of enlightenment and um and and spreading it around the world not just looking at the european enlightenment where we usually associate the term but i, I speaking of enlightenment i wanted to li lighten lighten up the the discussion a bit because it's it's always so easy to get into um you know uh, a bemoaning mood of how horrible the world is and I like the 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 mention earlier the the importance of spreading joy, uh, which by the way was part of the theme of the last American Sociological Association meetings, um, creating a community of joy. And uh, I would like to I like I think there are a lot of signs of hope. We have a lot of signs of hope in the world today, and uh, of course they don't make the headlines, um, but we have increasing. First of all, increasing participation of women in all spheres. We've seen that today in, in today's discussion, the importance of women who bring, you know, the, it's been the suppressed voice. Um, and then, the, and, and then of, of course, the Global South voice, which there's kind of a renaissance, I think, of, of uh, well, of Africa, of Global South uh, voices, and in part because of the decline of the American empire, which is which is opening up, I think more space uh, politically and culturally and so on around the world. Um, the power of nonviolence. Um, we we you know we've seen uh, a, a, an amazing number of of um, sort of strategic use of strategic nonviolence in recent decades. You know we never uh, you know Desmond Tutu once told a friend of mine. And when I grew up in South Africa, I never dreamed that we would see the end of apartheid in my lifetime. And, um, and you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall, I mean, we could go on and on. But of course, then we also need to see some kind of positive uh, development after we bring down the dictators. And then finally, I love this discussion about the power of the arts. And, um, whew, now, now I'm having trouble being brief, but one one quick bit of sociology. You know, Max Weber um, said there are four kinds of motivations that 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 cause people to act. There's there's instrumental rationality, which is kind of this calculation. This is kind of the intellectual part, right? The calculation of means and ends, and trying to choose the most appropriate means to achieve your ends. Value rationality which is also part of the intellectual work, um, you do the right thing because it, because it has value. The third one is the affective motivations, the emotions, and finally the traditional. So music and the arts, they bring all four of these, of these basic motivations. Uh, and so I think, I think that this is one of the reasons why, you know, the, the Delphi games, uh, the the Sum Art Association, you know, this emphasis on the, uh, sometimes I call it the aesthetics of peace, sometimes the aesthetics of resistance. I haven't decided which which one. And I like I like both actually because it's we're both resisting. This is kind of Gandhi. You, on the one hand, you resist the, the the existing system. On the other hand, you try to build up a new one. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Oh, that's very important. Yeah, thank you, Lester, and. Um... Pietro, are you still with us? Do you want to do a final comment from Nigeria? Um, I hope you've been listening. Ah, you're out in the back. Yes, yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Um, it's been interesting. Sorry, we have a committee meeting for our masonry. Okay, so, um, 
I think I don't know if I heard the the last speaker clearly when he said uh, something about America's influence or control with Renewway. I don't know if I got that right. Um, yeah, if that was what he was insinuating, I actually think the opposite. But that's another conversation for another day. Um, I think a lot has been said about action, and uh, I love the emphasis on action because um, I, I love this platform as well, lots of intellectuals, lots of ideologists. It's also important to translate these thinkings into practice, into action plans, frameworks, methodologies, however uh, we can get it into operations, in black and white or in context or however. So I think um, for me, that's, that's actually my last reflection for us to do more. For Rotary International, I think I forgot to address that, that part earlier, why we are not really involved in issues of um, Lebanon, Gaza, and all that. Yes, Rotary is in all these places, but of course, um, our, our ideology and our need for diversity and acceptability makes it really uh, constraining because... Um, I think even the, the little effort that was carried out in Ukraine, we, we, we had the organization and members clamped down in Russia, you know. So, yeah, I think for some, for some groups, it's now about um, what gives. I don't think the Delphi game is a panacea either. Um, I don't think uh, Rotary or humanitarian organizations is a panacea. I think the the war business is very lucrative, even more lucrative than oil. And beyond the immediate resources that comes to it, the the possibilities of um, power grab, regime change, and having a long term dividend in controlling the states outweighs the need for peace. And that's what we should really be concerned about because it, it it's really it's really incentivized and is, is, is largely becoming the, the system of might is right by the day. So we ideologists need to do more than idealize and put the thoughts into action and come into paradigm shifts that are more sustainable and progressive. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Everyone. Okay. Thank you so much, Pietro. Very wise words there. I think we need to get some economists uh, talking next time. And that's why I did actually, you know, try and get um, Naomi Klein here. But okay, thank you. Um, last comments, Inga, um, take it away. Yeah. Well, thank you, Thomas. Um, uh, where do I start? <laughs> uh, most of the time, I start uh, to jump on what the last speaker <laughs> was saying uh, because it's like fashion up um, urgency. Um, but then again, this thing about the sociology part, you know, the calculation and values, emotion and aesthetics, um, you know, uh, war is bad for business. War is bad for God, he doesn't like it. War is really bad for football. And most important, I like to tell you this, you haven't heard it in the news yet, but it's um, someone has initiated that women against war is also against sex. They're putting like a, there's going to be a campaign for to stop sex as long as there's war going on. Ah. And and uh, you like it, I can see you like it, Thomas. You're not well, sure it's in a play. I'm was... joking or not, you know? No, no, I think it should be done, seriously. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, but, you know, but the, so this this kind of how do we stop it with a, a narrative that get attentions, you know, so so the the, the singing uh, the the singing piece and the bulk uh, the uh, the Baltic countries they were actually holding hands across borders for peace, so that's why I'm saying the humming for peace the singing without words is a unity uh, oneness. Uh, we can uh, hold on, and and then I, I also holding on on the Greek uh, reference of talk of, um, of Christian. I'm working on this project with the the Erasmus Youth Project, and I call it um, Eyes Demo, 
and it's about the glaciers, the year of glaciers going to come. So it's like in uh, Sweden, Norway, Austria, Switzerland, and uh, and Greece. And I'm doing it intentionally because of of the Delphic in a way, because I, I this thing about melting of glaciers and melting of democratic institutions. How can we uh, work with science and arts to emphasize and to build and create and and to make this uh, gra uh, grassroots? Uh, so uh, so the, uh, so from Sweden, I have this uh, uh, bards for the climate, and they are uh, so so they are the bards, and they just recently been in last week in Lebanon. They've been in Ukraine, and and they're really using the methodology of of translating the news into the bards. And then I learned in this work, in, the, in writing this application, that bards is the same thing in Greek. It's called bardos. So this thing about singing and humming and really get our artists telling the stories that has to come forward. It's not one narrative, it's many of them. And, and, and to get the, the Delphic idea of know ourselves as human beings. You know, that's, it's really, I'm asking this group of, is it, we are 11, is it, or 10? Yeah, but it's like a football team, right? It's it's a small team that we can, we can lift each other, we can ma make ourselves better to perform and be the bar bardos of a new era of humanity. We can do it. So 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 I'm really like I, I really want us to you know get yourself stronger to be more brave I guess I will say together mm. Mm. and and then to connect this wisdom forum if you allow Thomas sure. to as intergenerational learning with the youngsters from seventeen to twenty five years old that's the the, the goal for the next two years in the project mm. okay thank you. Mm. Well, this is where I would like to break into poetry because I'm also a bard. So, and we use the same word in the in the Celtic languages and English. And you can't be a druid unless you're also a bard. So, I've done my bardic training. And and just to say, a few days ago, I was in Stonehenge with a bunch of druids and bards, actually in ritual in the middle of the stones, celebrating the equinox. And um, I was in Avebury giving a talk, which some of some people may have heard. It's online, so. I'm 100% with you, Inga, on that. And, you know, that's why I'm bothering to, to try and... That's why I went to Macedonia to, to the um, Struga Poetry Festival. And I, I'm, you know, as well as um, an academic, I'm also an artist, a poet, and a musician. So I'd like to also, you know, yeah. agree with that 100%. So look, um, who, Christian, your turn, sir. Final thoughts from the Oracle. Final thoughts. I thank you for listening. I thank you for your enthusiasm and to focus that a lot of our dreams and visions can be realized if we unite under the headline of Delphi, the power of peace, I would say, because Delphi is not just a point at a map. It is much, much more Unfortunately, we are not aware. It's a special place where peace, uh, uh, peace was born and found its successor in the UN today, the Amphictyonia. And believe me, seven times in three continents, we realized Delphic Games, worldwide Delphic Games, and testing was over. We know it can be done if we unite. So thank you for listening and thank you giving me the chance to learn. You're welcome. It's an uh, honor to have you. James, um, last thoughts from you, sir. The Oracle of Sussex. <laughs> You'll have to unmute. Oh, there we are. Uh, I was inspired by something that Ellis said, which was that there are some sort of cosmic power, cosmic rays of some sort. I'd like to ask her how we harness those. I'd like to direct those at uh, certain people who are causing these wars. 
uh, particularly in the Middle East. I'm particularly fond of Inga's point that we need a strategic plan for peace. I was a strategic plan with the British plan with the British government a long, long time ago, uh, and uh, they didn't take any notice of my plans, but uh, it was a good exercise. <laughs> I think it was educative. Uh, another thing that uh, struck me was uh, by George, uh, who said that he didn't think there was any chance of my uh, bold initiative in the Middle East to come into effect. And I'd like to just refer to this paper by, uh, well, it's actually from the UNS Review about, can you can you read it? It's, it's basically, it's a, an initiative from China. They had a, a Beijing declaration uh, just before, at the end of last year, bringing all the Palestinians together and effectively, uh, well, offering their support. Now, if, if Beijing came on, on board against America, it's 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 in far better position, debt wise, to to do so. Uh, then I think, then that might wake up the warring factions, particularly the Israelis. Maybe something would happen there. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was about the Club of Rome. I can't remember who mentioned it. Was it George again? Uh, it it was a bit of a dubious organisation because. It actually was a, a forerunner of uh, the World Bank, uh, what's going on at the moment with Klaus Schwab and so on. It, it, all, it, looks, it looks good because they had this wonderful report called The Limits to Growth, which is all about cutting back on it, consumption and so on. But it was, in fact, uh, a, 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 a conspiracy to stop people buying Middle East oil, would you believe? And it's it's part of the Israeli plan, which was hatched in hatched uh, around about 1980, uh, called the Clean Break, a new strategy for securing the realm, which was in turn about getting America to occupy, militarily occupy, a number of seven Muslim countries, which they did. They've already destroyed four of them. And Iran is unfortunately going to be next. So those, those, I, I found this whole uh, debate very interesting, and I'm very grateful to you, uh, Thomas, for bringing it about. Uh, well, it, it's extremely I wish we had more time. Thank I you, do. James. Um, yes, I, I noticed the Club of Rome thing, and I've got mixed feelings like you about it. Um, but. Um, Yes, so Elif, we haven't had your final thoughts. Final thoughts, and then I'll do a closing thing. Okay, thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you, everyone. I will start with uh, some very concepts, uh, new concepts, maybe, uh, briefly. We need a plan, strategic plan. We need all projects so far integrated under an umbrella called metaprogramming. Metaprogramming is the core of the ordinance, which thank you, Yelena, you shared our manifesto, but it is not only limited to that. Maybe one day I will talk in more detail. Uh, we need joy, as uh, Lester just left, but we need joy. Joy is one of the highest frequencies. And how the com cosmic support will come, uh, James, uh, we know uh, some techniques about it. It okay. comes only if there's a magnetic field down, which is generated by thought but thought backed up with energy frequency. If you don't have the frequency, thoughts just fade away. But thoughts are uh, preceding action. So uh, before the action, we need thoughts. We need borrowed interest. We need PR. We need intellect to attract the attention. And you know, uh, this decentralized mechanism works very well, for instance, social media. If you have uh, more likes, if uh, 200,000 uh, people are watching my speeches, you know, I have more power than the United States of America, I'm sorry to say, more than uh, Biden does. So it, the, the world is changing in terms of... Uh, and please, Sean, uh, please tell us when uh, you are planning to put the capsule into the Earth, because the timing is very important. Um, maybe you can make it in the equinox. And please have all signatures in a water-based ink. Uh, it is very important in terms of uh, transmission of the cosmic energy, thought energy into the material. 
uh, any ink wouldn't go. It's like uh, water-based ink. And please, online signatures should sign on paper as well. Uh, otherwise, we will fading. It is to uh, magnetic field rules, very simple. We will tell it in more details. I am uh, going to finish because uh, Christian Kirsch uh, had a first sentence when we begin. I never give up. May I read the poem? Just a little one. Thomas. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, it will all give us hope. And I wrote it on uh, the day before the equinox on 21st of uh, June. On the shores of the ocean, all is silent, but the wave whispering to the sand. Love won't give up. So we were not giving up, no matter what. Right. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, yes. And just to conclude, um, um, I, oh. I've been working on my 99 Names of Peace project about language. And I've just been researching the Akkadian language, one of the first, um, you know, international languages. And it's really ancestral to Hebrew and Arabic, both. I've been working on the words for peace in all these different languages. I've done, you know, um, Arabic and all of the different world languages. And their word for peace is sim very similar, silmu, to the Hebrew shalom, and the Arabic salam. Um, and this, this gives me hope that if we can go back to the origins, the sources, this is why I'm also a historian um, and run Historians for Peace. If we can find the common history of all the tribes of humanity, then I think we have a way forward. It's when one or two tribes break away and think they are the only tribe or the best tribe or the, you know, the top tribe that's the kind of thinking that I think we have to um, challenge because humanity, as, as our Baha'i friends said at the very beginning, humanity is one. We're ultimately one humanity, one tribe, one race. And in the Celtic world, the Druids were not sanctioned by any one particular tribe. They were, they were traveling around all the tribes and were honored and recognized by them all. And I think that's our duty as intellectuals. We, we, don't, we, we all have a different nationality and a passport, but actually we're universal humans, universal thinkers. And I, anyway, my slogan that I coined at the Jane Conference to finish with, the International Peace and Nonviolence Conference that took place, and we're doing the publication, is the counterpart to the call for general and complete disarmament. Many people focus on disarmament as their contribution to peace, which is very important, and we shouldn't forget that. But I want the counterpart, which is I want complete, general, and sustainable enlightenment, as well as general and complete disarmament. And I don't think we're going to get one without the other. So I'm going to keep bashing on about this as a philosopher. And um, I've just given a course in pool about this. Enlightenment's with the plural. Um, you know, because there are different types and flavors of enlightenment. There's Christian and Buddhist and pagan, and they're all valuable, and we need to start appreciating them. So, look, anyway, thank you so much for coming, and we meet again on the 30th of next month. Let's hope no more great, terrible shocks have happened, because, you know, um, let's have some joyous events, please. Uh, okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you, Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Blessings. Yes.